And good afternoon, everyone here in the United States. Good morning, everyone in Australia, and uh, good evening or, or uh, good early afternoon, depending on where you are elsewhere in the world. Thanks for joining us for this World Council of Credit Unions Challenge 2025 webinar, Open Banking, the Opportunities and Challenges Facing Credit Unions. My name is Greg Newman, Director of Communications for the World Council. We have the special honor today of welcoming executives from three of the world's largest credit union systems who will discuss how their organizations are approaching open banking. We'll hear from Michael Lawrence, CEO of the Customer Owned Banking Association, or COBA, World Council's direct member organization in Australia. Lance Noggle, Senior Director of Advocacy and Senior Counsel for Payments and Cybersecurity for Credit Union National Association, or CUNA here in the United States, World Council's direct member here. And also Patrick Barr, Policy Advisor on Open Banking for the Canadian Credit Union Association, that is World Council's direct member organization in Canada. We do wanna let you know about a couple of housekeeping notes. There is Spanish interpretation available for today's webinar. Tómense un momento para hacer clic en interpretación y elija su idioma inglés o español. If you have any questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type your questions in there. I'll be asking your questions to each speaker at the end of each of their presentations as time allows. And also today's webinar is being recorded and we'll have it available later tonight on the World Council YouTube channel tonight here in the US or during the day in Australia. And that's at youtube.com slash woku, youtube.com slash woku. We'll put a reminder of that up at the end of today's webinar. So we're gonna jump right into our first presentation of the day with Michael Lawrence, CEO of the Customer Owned Banking Association in Australia. He is also the treasurer of World Council's Board of Directors. Mike has over 30 years of experience in financial services, primarily gained with AMP Bank and National Australia Bank. He was the managing director of AMP Bank for eight years. Prior to this, Mike undertook senior roles in all distribution channels of banking, namely corporate, commercial, and retail having done so across three continents, Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And we start with Mike because Australia is one of the most advanced open banking markets in the world. And he's here to talk a little bit more about that. Mike, good morning in Australia. Good morning and uh, thank you, Greg. And thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, just take you through a presentation and hopefully that is up on screen uh, now. Um, just before I start, just a little bit about uh, the customer-owned banks or credit unions as they're commonly referred to around other parts of the world. Um, we have 66 customer-owned banks here in Australia, of which 62 of them are members of the uh, customer-owned banking association that we represent. Collectively, our sector has $146 billion worth of assets. So when we look at it as a collective, um, we're the, what I refer to as the fifth largest bank. Um, we have four very big dominant banks here that, re that represent about 80% of the market, uh, but collectively 146 billion uh, is not insignificant. We have 10% of all household deposits in Australia and more than four and a half million customers uh, across our 62 member organisations. Um, in November of 2017, the Australian government announced the consumer data right, CDR, uh, here in Australia, giving consumers more access to and control over their data, which traditionally had always sat inside uh, banking institutions and really been at the discretion of the banking institution as opposed to uh, being at the control of the individual customer. Driven by regulatory changes, shifting consumer preferences and technology enabled innovation, open banking or CDR as I'll refer to it through this presentation, gives consumers the power to securely share their selected data, banking data with accredited third parties. And there'll be more on that because the third parties are not just other banks. Um, introduced into the banking sector in July of two, uh, 2020, um, and then it's gonna be rolling out to energy and also telecommunication 
and the government is then talking about other sectors as well. The government published a report on open banking in Australia, which outlined the rationale for it. And it was, and it's the current prime minister's primary project here in Australia. So since he was treasurer, so he was previously treasurer before prime minister, uh, and this is his baby, so to speak. And so it is being pushed through at quite, uh, quite um, amount of speed, which can be problematic problematic because this is an enormously complex area. There are four principles that have emerged uh, from his initial report, and that is that open banking should be customer focused. It should be for the customer. Um, it should be about the customer and be seen as the customers from the customer's perspective. So very customer focused. Open banking should encourage competition. It should be done to increase competition for the banking products and services available to customers so that the customers can make better choices. Open banking should create opportunities. It should provide a framework on which uh, new ideas and businesses can emerge and grow and establishing a vibrant and creative data industry. And finally, the government said open banking should be efficient and fair. It should be efficient with security and privacy in mind um, so that it is sustainable and fair without being complex or costly. Um, now that is arguably debatable given where we're at because it is complex and it is costly. Um, there's four major banks here in Australia and they control about 80% of the market share as I mentioned uh, and they're significantly better resourced uh, than the smaller players here in Australia. As I said, customer-owned banks, we're the fifth largest deposit holders or the fifth largest bank in its entirety, if you look at the sector. Um, but we are seeing increasing consolidation and mergers. And I know that is not unusual throughout the world, uh, but 20 years ago, we had more than 350 uh, credit unions or customer-owned banks. Uh, 10 years ago, 150, and we're now down to about 67. So the, the, the consolidation um, is continuing to happen. I, just in terms of the CDR regime here in Australia, the oversight of the customer data right CDR policy has recently shifted um, from the Australian Competition and Con Consumer Commission, or ACCC as we call it, which is Australia's competition regulator to the Australian government treasury. Um, the CDR regime is complex with multiple regulators. The ACCC is working with the Office of Australian Information Commissioner, so the, AO, the, sorry, the OAIC and the data standards body in the development and implementation of CDR. Um, it's the data standards body who are responsible for the cre creation of the technical standards for the sharing of consumer data. The OAIC are the primary complaints handler for the CDR scheme and the OAIC, plenty of acronyms, will have a range of investigative and enforceable powers to handle privacy complaints and carry out other regulatory activities with respect to privacy. So you can just see already um, the amount of complexity when you're dealing with a whole lot of different regulators. The box on the right is just to highlight, and it's not easy to read, but just to highlight some of the data recipients that have already been accredited, and they're not just all banks, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. In January 2020, the Treasurer of Australia announced the inquiry into future directions of consumer data rights. The inquiry was asked to make recommendations on options to, in, to expand CDR functionality. This includes how the CDR could be expanded to include right access, so that consumers not only choose to share their data through the CDR, but they also apply for and manage products, including open banking, 
by initiating payments. The inquiry made 100 recommendations, I'm not, certainly not going to go through them, on the future directions of CDR and was asked to identify opportunities to leverage the CDR to enhance opportunities for Australian consumers, businesses and the Australian econ economy and leverage the CDR infrastructure to support productivity and a safe and efficient digital economy. Some of the impact on consumers, um, there's really four future directions, the CDR for consumers and ADIs. Now ADIs are authorised deposit taking institutions, uh, commonly referred to as banks, which includes our credit unions. Um, and those four future directions are moving it beyond data sharing towards data empowered consumers, beyond open banking towards an economy-wide foundation, beyond a standalone system towards an integrated data ecosystem and be, beyond Australian borders towards international digital opportunities. So that's the vision the government has for CDR here in Australia. This future CDR will provide greater everyday benefits, certainly for Australian consumers, as they'll be able to safely use online service apps um, or online services or apps uh, to, for example, notify them when their bills are due, arrange bills to be paid at best times, uh, move money between accounts to minimise interest costs and fees. Uh, it could be about advising them in real time which services are best for them, switch them onto under these services and provides reports on money that has been saved. It may also give them up-to-date dashboards showing um, who they are sharing the data with, uh, how it's being used and allow them um, to change those things and to make um, the sharing, uh, well, if they wanna stop the sharing as well. It's really putting the control in the hands of the consumer, which is pretty scary when you think of it from a banking perspective, when you've always been in control of the data, this is putting it in the control of the consumer. Uh, there's multiple use cases uh, for CDR for consumers, um, but the barriers to entry are high and it is a highly complex regime for consumers to understand and leverage. Customers are looking to switch to new bank for a savings account or to sign up for a credit card would usually need to gather all the banking documentation, such as their transaction history, the identification documents, and then they would need to apply to that bank, either online or over the phone or in person through branches. However, with open banking, the customer can request to send this information from their existing bank to a new bank with just a click of a couple of buttons. Customers can then choose to use op open banking to give authorised providers, such as comparison services or budgeting apps, um, access to their data so that they can provide the product options, recommendations or services, such as alerts or budgeting tools um, that are more tailored uh, than you know, the specific uh, financial institutions probably providing at this point in time. So this is where you're going to have third party providers, fintechs enter the space and, uh, and look to start controlling some of the data of um, the consumers. I must emphasize though, that the data is at the control of the consumer. It can only be released by the consumer to another third party. Um, this month, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, um, which is Australia's largest bank, put it into perspective, uh, CBA, the, as it's referred to, excuse me, has assets in excess of $1 trillion, Aussie dollars. Uh, so a significant um, size organisation. It's already become one of the first of the big four banks that I referred to uh, to ingest data under the CDR um, scheme. And it's looking to boost its digital off offerings in the wake of certainly the pandemic that we are um, in at the moment. 
This is going to have a significant impact on the competitive landscape of the banking market. So you think of what I said earlier, where these big four banks here in Australia, and I know it's it's uh, very similar in Canada as well, where they're dominated by some large banks. When you've got four large banks controlling 80% of the market, and then we are playing in the other area, when they become data recipient, recipients, it is going to change the competitive landscape. Um, but it's not, not all doom and gloom, because arguably they're the ones who have got the most to lose. And I'll talk a little bit more. This slide refers to Regional Australia Bank. Uh, that's one of ours. It's a, um, a mutual bank or a credit union, uh, as, as most of you refer to. It actually came to the market first. Uh, it's, um, it's one of the leaders in technology and innovation here in Australia and actually did the first transaction here in Australia. And I'll just quickly digress. That first transaction was for a personal loan. The, the customer had all their information with one of the large four banks. Within a matter of seconds, uh, at, at the authorization of the customer, Regional Australia Bank had, had received over 3,000 pieces of data from the large bank. Within a matter of two minutes, it was populated into spreadsheets, and was approved and the personal loan was approved in two minutes. So you think about the efficiency gains uh, just in that alone. Um, the, the benefits of the CDR re regime can only be realized as an accredited data recipient. However, many of our customer owned banks are still finding it really challenging to become data holders due to the significant investment in, in, and cost um, and it's going to be a while before they join the likes of Regional Australia Bank as, a, as an ADR. Um, it is complex. Um, some of the players in the market, uh, open banking is going to dramatically increase the levels of competition and innovation within Australia. Uh, we've got the big four banks, those large financial institutions are able to compete on price, branding, functionality, and they're a large resourced bank, tens of thousands of employees. Compared to some of ours, even our largest is only uh, in the low thousands, uh, where you know some of our smallest may only have 20 employees. It is expected that these big banks um, are going to uh, fiercely defend their existing market share, as these banks have the most to lose, given that they control 80% of the consumer market. The mutuals, credit unions, um, and other smaller banks uh, often don't have the same resources as uh, to compete on price as the larger banks. But their true strength um, uh, is that they generally have a level of service, uh, consumer sentiment, and a relationship that's been built on historically through human interaction. So rather than compete on price, these organisations will, uh, our organisations will focus on building a deeper understanding of their member or customer, uh, their demographics, their geography, um, and allowing them to compete on the closeness of the relationship and the personalized experience, the banking uh, with them in this digital world. Fintechs coming into the space with access to new data, fintechs are going to seek to compete on functionality, service and experience. Uh, fintechs will leverage CDR data to build a fuller picture of their customers, deliver specific and highly personalized services, and many of them have become ADRs themselves. And then we've got neobanks entering the market. Neobanks are nimble organizations with lower cost base. They're unencumbered by legacy infrastructure. However, not many of them are surviving because of uh, uh, because of COVID, um, and that's for another day. Uh, the regime is forcing digital transformation on institutions that would prefer more, and we'd prefer more time to implement and more choice about their investment priorities. Non-major banks received uh, an additional year, so those big four had to move first. We were given a further year to implement because of the complexities, uh, and the government, and um, uh, 
heard our, our advocacy around, we need the big four to go first. We need to ride on their coattails in terms of their learnings. Um, the CDR rules have been changing mid-implementation and that's creating an enormous amount of angst, enormous amount of work for our members um, and there's been a real mismatch between the rule changes um, and the related changes to technical standards. Uh, so it's putting at risk um, implementation timelines. So over 30 ADIs have received varying exemptions uh, from the ACCC that I referred to earlier. Uh, the, the, the customer owned banking ecosystem is complex. Um, there, you know, we rely on third party providers uh, to provide this service. Uh, core banking systems, uh, cyber security, um, operational inputs, all from third parties. Um, it's been a real struggle to work with these providers to comply with this really complex regime, given the technical standards are really high. And unlike other regimes, um, policy is really being done on the run here. And when you think of the security side of things uh, and the importance of security for this, for this new system, um, it, it is problematic. And just finally, uh, the competitive impacts on open banking are really yet to be realised um, in, in the banking market here. We're still in the implementation phase, albeit that the big banks have gone live, live on data sharing, uh, on product data sharing. Um, so it's impossible right now to really tell how it's going to change the market in Australia. Um, but I think those with early adopters, those that are not just investing in it from a compliance perspective, but from an innovation perspective, are going to be in a, a better position in terms of um, building that competitive nature and actually taking some market share. So uh, on that note, Greg, I'll, um, I will pause there. Michael, that is really incredible information. And, you know, it's, what's, what's interesting to me is that no matter what part of the financial services industry you're in, this is presenting some stress. You know, you mentioned that the big banks have an advantage, but they're also very concerned about the fact that they could lose market share through this. We do have one question. Uh, it's from Joe. He asks, did the Australian government set a standard format that all data has to be sent and received in? Uh, yes, so there are standards, but as I said, it's been um, it's been a bit of policy on the run. And the problem with that, uh, again, because of the complexity, and we we have we've been at the table with those discussions, as all banks have, uh, to help shape that. Um, but as you come closer to uh, implementation, the moment you you have one small change to any standard. Uh, you think of what that means from a technical perspective back inside your institution, um, it is massive. And, uh, and that's why it's putting implementation at risk. But there are standards that have been set and agreed by the broader sector, not just enforced upon us by, by government. One other question, it's from uh, David. He asks, um, what is... Um, who actually owns the customer data? The customer does. The customer is in full control. So you think of all the data that a customer traditionally has. You might have banked with a, an institution for 30 years and you think of all the credit card data, the transactional data, the mortgage data, personal loan data that's always sat inside a bank. That is now put in the control of the consumer. If the consumer wants to give that data to a fintech, to another bank uh, who is, a, a, is an accredited data recipient, at the push of a button, that data is transferred to a third party. And that was my example with Regional Australia Bank with their transaction, over 3000 pieces of data for an, for an individual customer moved from one bank to another bank and an approval for a personal loan in two minutes because it populates and feeds into into spreadsheets and approve and um, application forms. We do have some more questions, but unfortunately, we are uh, needing to get on to some of the other speakers here. Mike, thanks so much, and we'll try to get. Uh, if you're interested, we'll try to get the questions to Mike via email. 
Um, up next is Lance Noggle. He is the Senior Director of Advocacy and Special Counsel for Payments and Cybersecurity with Credit Union National Association, or CUNA, as it's known here in the United States. He has held that position since 2013. In his role, Lance uh, provides legal and policy strategies for privacy, cybersecurity, and financial services for CUNA, which serves as a constituency of more than 6,300 members and 40 state credit union associations in the United States. He also researches and develops policy positions on privacy, cybersecurity, and technology, and advocates for these positions before the United States Congress, regulators, the press, coalitions, and association members. Lance is presenting today on where the U.S. is when it comes to open banking and the possible implications of both federal laws and state laws that could have on open banking. Lance. Thanks, Greg. And, and after uh, listening to uh, Michael's uh, presentation on CDR, I, I can assure you we are absolutely nowhere. Um, you'll notice there's this, an absence of slides and it's because uh, we're just in a different spot here in the United States. And uh, Michael now has me scared of where we may go and, 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 uh, and how complex it might be. So I'll just give, uh, I'll just give the um, participants just a little bit of information on, on the US banking system um, and why it's so complex and why getting something is, is uh, complex as uh, open banking is difficult. Um, and that's even if we were supporting it. And I'm not sure where our members are at this point because it's in such a, a nascent phase. Um, so in the US, we have approximately 5,000 credit unions and 5,000 banks. Um, credit un unions um, can range anywhere from nearly a billion dollars in deposits, and we have many with less than a billion. And we have multiple federal and state regulators for credit unions and banks. So just for an example, at the federal level, and that's the whole national country in the United States, we have a federal credit rate, fed a, a regulator for credit unions, we have multiple regulators for banks. And then each state has a banking regulator and a credit union regulator. And then we have another series of regulators who may, uh, who may also um, um, and be in charge of some consumer protection regulations and some uh, security regulations. So it's really, really, really complex and it can make your head hurt uh, just thinking about it. Um, so even who would be in charge of, of shepherding uh, open banking standards uh, would be difficult to determine. Um, obviously here in the United States, it would probably have to start with, a, with some legislation, an act of Congress, um, something that would be signed by the president. Um, and then go to rulemaking by one of these many uh, uh, regulatory bodies that we have for banks in the United States. Um, so like I said, we're really far behind. We don't have any sort of defined open banking uh, uh, standards yet, but that's not to say we're not looking at it. And that's not to say that the private industry isn't doing something. Um, so we don't have any current pending re re uh, regulation or draft regulation. Um, that again, similar to PSD2 or CDR. Um, but we do have some um, industry initiatives and some regulatory bodies that have looked at open banking and are sort of uh, sort of um, like kicking the tires, if you will, to, to develop some standards and see, see, see what it might look like. And I'll, I'll um, refer to one of these efforts last and it's through our Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and they're working with a law that was passed um, uh, um, as part of the Dodd-Frank Act, which was a big set of uh, uh, banking laws passed in 2010, coming from stemming from the financial crisis. So we've had some some law in place from 2010 requiring um, some standards put in place for uh, the ownership of data, and this could be where we would see some open banking come from but we haven't seen any regulations written on this law and the CFPB has, has, um, has done nothing more. And that's, again, that's the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That's one of our regulators. They've nothing, done nothing more than collect data over the course of the last 11 years. So we've seen some other efforts um, by some of our other regulatory agencies and some from some of our uh, uh, associations. Um, so we've seen, uh, uh, the Electronic Payments Association, NACHA, some of you may be familiar with them. Um, they're one of our standard setting uh, organizations for payments. And they have a, an effort going, setting, uh, uh, creating um, 16 standard APIs that could be used for some 
payments initiatives. And um, we also have some information sharing from one of our, uh, our cybersecurity uh, groups called Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And I know that they operate uh, internationally, FSISAC, and they're developing uh, APIs for, uh, to help financial institutions share information, but this would be for, for um, uh, cybersecurity issues. So, um, so again, data, data ownership, data ownership and governance is a major issue. In the United States, we don't have comprehensive privacy regulations or data security regulations. So we do have privacy and data security regulations for financial institutions, but not for other, not necessarily for other entities at the federal level. So that kind of makes even um, uh, sharing data with, uh, with other organizations a huge concern. Just our organizations really are reluctant to let anyone have any sort of data without knowing that it would be properly secure. So you can see we have a lot of moving parts that we need to look at before we can get anywhere near where, uh, you know, they are in Australia or uh, Europe or other places where they may have some open banking. And I'm going to go ahead and, and just kind of tell you what, what we've sort of looked at from the um, Consumer Financial Bureau, um, looking at, again, Section 1033 from the Dodd-Frank Act from 2010. So this is how slowly we move. Um, we, we're just now, just now still gathering data on this law. So, uh, so um, and some of the things that they've looked at and they're concerned about is the data access and the scope of access, like who should get it and how, how deep the access should go um, and what, what is, would be actually be the consumer's data and what would be um, a financial institution's data, you know, depending on what, what is, you know, are transactions owned by a consumer or are they owned by, uh, owned by the financial institution and other information and um, intelligence that they've collected, collected on uh, a consumer. Um, one thing that we that is big here because we don't have a lot of APIs is credential based access and screen scraping. Um, and there's a lot of concern with financial institutions how that how that works. The implications of of our uh, uh, credit union members and, uh, and and banking customers giving their credentials to another institution that's using those credentials to log in and take information that way. It's not as secure as an API, um, but it's the way that a lot of FinTech uh, companies do get information uh, from a financial institution. Um, issues that are important to us are disclosure and informed consent. Um, disclosure is a huge part of financial regulation in the United States. Um, and we're concerned that consumers might not completely understand, and especially in the case of screen scraping, right? They might not understand what it means when they give, they give um, this important information, their credentials to a third party. Obviously privacy is a huge concern. Um, and, and as we continue to work through just the national privacy uh, laws here in the United States, um, how, how this would work without a national privacy law is very, very, um, you know, up in the air, um, transparency and control, um, security and data minimization. Again, you know, parts of the laws that we don't have. Um, looking at how you know accuracy, disputes, accountability, and some of this is going towards with the the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's what they're looking to do. Part of it is allowing consumers complete access to their information so they can dispute um, uh, and have a you know have the financial institutions will have accountability. Um, and also, you know, loads of legal issues around, around this. So I think that as we move forward, um, it'll be, it's really interesting to hear the other presentations and watch what goes on in the other countries. I mean, we are so um, far behind um, that it's likely that there will be more private solutions, which often happens here where financial institutions could partner with fintechs or others and allowing them to have access to uh, or allowing them to allow uh, customers or members of a credit union to have access because of their partnerships, not because of any sort of legal requirement. Here we've actually seen APIs broken for um, things like uh, 
for um, um, P2P payments, you know, things like uh, the Cash App or, or others that operate similar, uh, similar payments um, uh, here where they've had APIs and where, where uh, financial institutions have broken those APIs and not allowed them to operate without having some sort of uh, direct agreement in place. So I think as we move forward, and I'm cognizant of the time here, as we move forward, uh, the United States will probably look to adopt some, some practices from other countries. We've already seen some of our privacy laws at the state level uh, mirror and look to GDPR. So I would expect to see similar for PSD2 and CDR as we look and hopefully adopt the best practices that other countries are, are, um, are developing. But again, I think anything will be years and years off before we see some real, real uh, um, regulations uh, requiring this or real, real um, laws requiring this. I think personally, I think we need to um, crack the privacy nut, if you will, prior to moving on to any sort of open banking. And that's been real, a real complex issue as, as no state and the federal government doesn't want to, they all want to have their hand in it and have, you know, do their own type of uh, requirements. So Greg, um, I'd be happy to take any questions or, or, or turn it back to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Lance. That's interesting because, you know, it's it seems like with a lot of financial issues, you know, we are a little bit behind where Europe is sometimes. You know, I remember going to Canada for the first time in 2014 and experiencing uh, a pin and chip. And I, I was saying, what is this? And they were well, you got to put your chip in there, then you got to put your pin in. And we don't do that in the United States. And it didn't come for another, you know, three or four years. Is part of the reason we're not seeing more of a thrust for this in the United States is because we saw in Australia, what Mike said was that the government is really pushing it forward. The government's not going to do that here. And it doesn't seem like any industry groups are doing that here, correct? I think that, you know, we'll see fintech push push it as they, I think that we could see consumer demand as people don't have access to cool things that they can do other places. You know, we're already behind. We don't, we, we really don't have faster payments here yet or, or real-time payments, I should say. Um, so in some ways we're still operating in the dark ages with some of these uh, services. So as we, as we fall behind and, and, and I, I think as, uh, as, as consumers can't do certain things and they know it's available somewhere else, that might cause a push for it. And that might cause more of a private solution to it as opposed to government mandates. But I would assume, as I mentioned, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, because they have this you know, data ownership uh, project in place, it could emanate from there at some point, and they might be laying the groundwork behind the scenes that we just don't know about. But but it's it, there's nothing on the horizon right now. We do have one question for you, but I almost feel like it might be a, a, a better a question to ask our next speaker, because it talks about whether you can reiterate where Canada stands in terms of legislation on this. Would you defer that to Patrick? Absolutely. Okay. Well, Lance, thanks so much. We may have some more questions coming in a little bit, but uh, thanks for letting us know where the U.S. stands on this so far, because I think um, certainly we have a lot of audience members out there from the U.S. who are probably, uh, along with you, kind of waiting to see where this all goes. Our last presenter of the day does join us from Canada. Patrick Barr is the Policy Advisor on Open Banking for the Canadian Credit Union Association, leading CCUA's open banking advocacy efforts and research objectives. He is also on the board of directors for Open Banking Initiative Canada and is helping to shape that organization's strategic value and business plan as it develops Canada's first market-led open banking ecosystem. Patrick joins us today to talk about the challenges and opportunities that open banking is presenting credit unions in Canada. Patrick, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Greg. And just to give everyone on the call a rough idea of the size of the credit union market here in Canada, our 233 member credit unions serve approximately 5.9 million Canadians, which is uh, about 20% of the market. And they have uh, just over $266 billion in assets. So today I'll be speaking about open banking, which is still in the early stages of development here in Canada. So much of my presentation will be um, discussing this framework development process and what a credit union's role in all of that has, has been. 
Um, so Canada's journey towards open banking started about two and a half years ago in September 2018 when our federal government announced an advisory committee uh, was going to be formed that would be ta that would be tasked uh, with determining if open banking would benefit Canadians. And then if so, uh, when and how should a framework be implemented to facilitate it? Then uh, a few months later in January 2019 to gather input from the industry, consumer groups and government bodies, uh, this advisory committee started launching public consultations on the merits of open banking. Then in January 2020, after many delays that I won't bore you with uh, here today, the advisory committee released their findings from that consultative process. And there, there's really key three or three uh, key takeaways that you need to know from that. The first was that there was a recommendation for the development of a framework to facilitate open banking here in Canada. Uh, an ambitious timeline of approximately two years was set for its implementation. And then lastly, a, a second consultation was announced that would be focusing on, on the more granular components of what this framework would look like. Things such as rules of the system, governance models, scope of data and participants, things like that. And this was scheduled for, for spring 2020. But um, spring 2020 arrived and like the rest of the world, everyone's priorities naturally shifted to dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and almost all non-COVID-19 related um, consultations and projects were really uh, put on the sidelines. But uh, late last year, November 2020, uh, our government really recognized that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic had expedited the ongoing digitization of many of our industries, including the financial sector, and that a lot of unsecure methods of sharing data were, were becoming increasingly prevalent here, notably uh, screen scraping, which our previous um, presenters have alluded to where you share uh, consumer login credentials. So because of this um, increase in unsecure methods of sharing data and this uh, ongoing digitization, the advisory committee relaunched that second phase of consultations. And in advance of this, they actually shared a set of proposals with stakeholders, such as the Canadian Credit Union Association, or what I'll refer to as CCUA going forward. And um, if you had compiled all of these proposals together, it would form um, what will eventually be the Canadian Open Banking Framework. And before we take a look at this uh, proposed framework that was shared, uh, we'd like to provide just a very brief overview of, of ways that credit unions and CCUA have been working to, to shape this framework and, um, and, and really trying to shape in a way that, that, benefit mem that benefits members. And uh, we'll be discussing that on the next slide. So CCUA and its member credit unions have been very engaged with this file since it was first announced in September 2018, recognizing the, the huge impact that it's going to have on the sector. And some of the key engagements and activities that we've been involved in have been uh, written testimony to this advisory committee, um, verbal testimony to the, our, some of our uh, Senate committees, uh, regular meeting, regularly meeting with uh, members of parliament and senators uh, here really just to socialize what some of our policy positions are and what some of the uh, credit union views on open banking are. And following many of these um, really regular and persistent uh, engagements with our government on the issue, uh, credit unions have become uh, trusted partners to the government in shaping this framework, being uh, regularly selected to participate in consultations and having um, uh, re regularly having a lot of our, our positions and our reports uh, cited in, uh, in official government uh, documents. So I'll just quickly touch on the next slide uh, what some of these um, key advocacy and policy positions have been. So we facilitate several committees within the Canadian Credit Union Association on open banking. And these committees are typically comprised of credit union leaders, executives, lawyers, things like that. And they're responsible for developing policy positions that guide our advocacy with the government. And on screen here, we have um, what some of our most pertinent policy positions have been um, as identified by our committees and uh, what we've been advocating to the government through those avenues that were mentioned on the, the previous screen. And since we only have about 15 minutes today, we can't go through all of these, uh, but we'd be happy to share um, a more comprehensive report with any um, attendees today, if you're interested in reading about them. But for today, we'll just we'll touch on two of them. So the number one priority identified by our members was to ensure that credit unions have the ability to participate in this federal open banking system as we recognize that it has immense value uh, for our members. 
However, some of our, our smaller credit unions have, have raised the concern that open banking will introduce really overwhelming compliance and regulatory costs, in addition to uh, costs related to investments in, uh, in technology that many of our, our smaller credit unions just simply can't undertake. So to address the, these differing stances between the large members who are very interested in participating and some of the smaller ones who may, maybe um, don't have quite the same interest level, we've been advocating for an opt-in system here in Canada in which credit unions have the, the option to participate, but not the obligation to. And we've been very happy that the, the government of Canada has been receptive to this ask and they, they've included it in their proposals for what the framework should look like. But the, the overarching and arguably, I would say most challenging issue that impacts every single one of our policy positions shown on screen here, and pretty much every engagement we have with government related to open banking, concerns um, risks around misalignments between the federal and provincial regulation here in Canada. And for those of you who are not aware, uh, Canada is a federation with division of powers split between the federal government, 10 provinces and three territories. And the large banks in Canada are regulated at the federal level and credit unions with the exception of approximately two are um, regulated at the provincial level. So the framework here in Canada is actually being developed by a federal entity, which here is the Department of Finance. So it's being designed through the lens of federal institutions. So there are concerns or risks that differences between regulation at the two levels between the federal and provincial levels um, that this could inadvertently create barriers or, or imbalances between uh, credit unions and their uh, federal counterparts with the banks. So there's a lot of work going on here with credit unions and CCUA to, to address this issue of misalignments between uh, regulation. So now I'll just give everyone a brief snapshot of what this proposed framework looks like. So the framework in Canada will be read only to start. However, there will be consideration for right access given in the future, which will open the door for things like payment initiation that we see in uh, the EU today. And the reason for this is because Canada is currently undergoing a, a quite lengthy payments modernization process. And the industry and then the government's advisory committee had all agreed that right access should be something that's implemented after this payments modernization is completed. And then um, another point for the framework, uh, what I mentioned on the, the last uh, slide was that uh, participation will be mandatory for large federal banks, which is probably going to be our big six banks, which is in line with, with the UK's approach where it was compulsory for the CMA nine banks. And then other smaller federal institutions or provincial institutions like credit unions can choose to opt in later. Uh, the scope of data for what, what open banking will include is expected to be phased based on the complexity and risk of that data. Uh, for example, uh, our first phase will likely include um, transaction accounts, things like debit and credit, uh, as well as savings accounts, term deposits, uh, more, more basic accounts like that. And then mortgage, uh, mortgage accounts, retirement accounts, uh, foreign exchange accounts, uh, things like that will be slowly brought into scope over time, likely over a, a multi-year period. And I should note too that um, the, the scope of what data will be included, for, what, uh, for the scope of what data will be included, priority is going to be given to uh, data that's currently widely shared via screen scraping since the government wants to, to mitigate its use. So if it's used for a screen scraping use case right now, it will very likely be included in that, uh, that first phase of, of data. Uh, the next point is that um, there will be a tiered risk-based accreditation for all participants who would like to, to join the open banking ecosystem. And there will also be a, a streamlined process for consumers to submit complaints about how um, third-party providers or financial institutions have handled their data. And a government body will, will review these complaints and be able to provide um, or will, will assign liability and uh, recourse for any consumer whose, um, whose uh, data rights were uh, violated. And th there's two points at the bottom here on the slide uh, that have question marks behind them. And the reason uh, why the question marks are there is because they were proposed by the government, but they're quite contentious and there isn't a lot of um, 
um, I'll say unity in the industry about whether or not they support these uh, proposals. And the first proposal with a question mark is um, whether or not a reciprocal, there should be a requirement for a reciprocal sharing of data. Uh, and this is because in the government's original proposal, they said that anyone who wants to participate in the system, you'll have um, essentially an assurance that if you start sharing data, you'll receive data of equal or comparable value from other um, institutions in the ecosystem. And at a face level, most um, industry participants agreed with this, um, with this principle. However, there is a bit of a complication that was being raised that if you require that data is shared back between institutions, a, a consumer or a, a member of a credit unit may not want that reciprocal data flow to happen. So if you mandate uh, reciprocity of data flows, this could actually come at the expense of consumers ability to control how their data is shared. So currently um, industry participants are discussing how to, how to find balance of ensuring that everyone who's participating is equally sharing value while still making sure that it's not shared without um, against the consumer's will. And the, the second question is around whether or not there should be a single technical standard that all participants use, which was the, the, the recommendation of the government. This is because many of the, the fintechs here in Canada, they don't wanna be confined to a single standard that some of them may view as being suboptimal. Uh, but on the contrary, uh, many of the incumbent institutions don't want there to be a complex patchwork of standards that, that no one can, can align on. This is because this will potentially um, increase costs for, for aligning with all the different standards and as well um, pose um, some security risks if there's gaps between them. So this is just a very high level snapshot, a snapshot of um, what the framework will look like and um, some challenges that are arising. Uh, but now we'll quickly discuss um, what the next steps for Canada will be. So the next steps for Canada is that this, uh, this advisory committee will be presenting um, their, their viewpoints on the proposed framework and all the, the feedback that they've received uh, from the industry to our Minister of Finance, who will be making the final decision for what the, the framework should look like. This was supposed to happen in January, but again, there's been many delays and will likely be happening um, uh, next month. And then once those um, proposals or once a framework is set, then there will be a final consultation where um, the industry will decide on what the implementation deadlines and uh, timeline should really look like here in Canada. And the general consensus from, from uh, industry here in Canada is that this framework will be, be finalized and implemented in uh, I would, I would say late 2022, mid to late 2022, barring any more setbacks. Um, and then the next thing is just, it's really pertinent uh, when you're thinking about uh, open banking in Canada, not think of it in a silo, because it, it's really part of a, a broader movement around uh, consumer data sharing. And um, what open banking eventually looks like here will be dependent on all of these different initiatives that are shown on screen, which are unfortunately uh, out of the scope of today's presentation. Uh, but as I mentioned before, if you're interested in reading about them, we'd be happy to share a more detailed report with you. So for our, our second last slide here, we'll be just talking about preparing today because while this framework is still most likely two years away, credit unions in Canada are doing a lot to prepare in advance with some uh, examples shown here on screen. And the, the natural first step for preparing has been planning for the changing rules of financial institutions. You often hear that the role of traditional financial institutions will change with open banking, especially as um, platforms become increasingly prevalent where consumers or members can, can often go to one location, they can handpick all of the different financial services or products they'd like to receive from, uh, from a variety of institutions uh, to, to build their financial profile, as opposed to just having one primary uh, financial institution who controls the whole relationship, uh, kind of like an Amazon for banking. But with that going on and with that expectation, there's a lot of talk about how we need to consider what the, the future role of financial institutions and credit unions will be here in Canada. And it really will differ on whether or not credit unions lean towards being these platform providers or whether or not they lean towards being the, the types of institutions who offer their products and services on those, um, on those uh, platforms. 
naturally here, a lot of our uh, conversations have skewed towards uh, more on the platform side, since typically in that role, you can continue to control the primary customer relationship, which is something that's very important to keeping um, that competitive advantage for credit unions, since so much of that competitive advantage is linked to their, their deep knowledge of members and the, the, the communities they serve. But in addition to preparing for the changing roles of financial institutions, there's also lots of work going on in identifying what the most useful use cases and products for um, credit union members will be and uh, how we can prepare to offer them. Um, lots of work going around, or lots of work on uh, data governance strategies, making sure that credit unions here are agile and prepared for whatever the future holds. And also a lot of work going on around um, hiring and developing staff for the future. Because the truth is, a lot of the most important roles for a credit union five years from now aren't the type of people who are currently staffed there today. Especially when we talk about the importance of developing APIs and all that, um, I would be shocked if uh, most credit unions had uh, API, uh, API architects, things like that on staff today. So a lot of them are really working towards either, either hiring for them now or developing and um, training staff internally right now so they can prepare for the future. And as I mentioned before, since we only had about 15 minutes, this is very much so a bird's eye view of what's going on here in Canada today. But if you are interested, I'd be happy to share more detailed report with you. And seeing that we are close to time, I'll um, leave things there and we can uh, open it up to, to questions if there are any. Yeah, there are actually quite a few. Thanks, Patrick. And um, if uh, Mike and also Lance want to turn their cameras and microphones on too, because um, you, you might want to have a, a couple of cracks at answering some of these. But one of the th one of the questions that jumped out that we didn't have time for earlier, but I think it's a question that probably a lot of people who are on the call have is it, it speaks to kind of what credit unions would have to prepare for. And Lenny, who is from our our North Macedonian uh, League and credit union. Uh, basically wanted to know what this means for credit unions of a certain size. And it's probably not a one size fits all answer to that, but she asked how, how much approximate budget is needed um, for banks or credit unions to implement open banking in Australia. That was a question for Australia, but is that something that really translates, Mike? Look, it, it, <laughs> how long's a piece of string? Um, <laughs> it, really, it really depends on the organization. I can tell you that that for the major banks, uh, that is costing them in the hundreds of millions. In our, in our sector, it can range from tens of thousands to even into the hundreds of thousands. Um, I think the critical thing for credit unions, because we are cooperative, is to work together. Um, and identify third parties that help that can help you deliver. And if you do it collectively, obviously, obviously it will um, help bring down the cost. But as we all know, everyone's pipes and technology and platforms are different. Uh, so there's that complexity that sits within that. And it's, it's not just as, as easy as bolting it on uh, to existing systems. Um, there was also a question for, Lan for Lance in here. Brendan asks, Lance, are there any precedents in technological financial history that we could look to for ideas about how open banking could play out in the U.S.? Wow, that's a that's a good question, and and I'm not really sure that I'm not really sure that that I have an answer for that. I mean, I, I would just think that we could look to see how some some products have developed. Um, you know, through industry as opposed to not, not regulation. But I can't really, off the top of my head, I can't point it to, to any precedences. I, I would probably look to maybe, you know, the more recent example would be say, um, the development of uh, real-time payments through one of the, the payments uh, providers um, and competing with, the, with uh, the Fed. So, you know, we do in the United States have a good history of the private sector developing um, things and sometimes pulling the government along. So again, I think we'll, we'll probably see it 
if we see if, if it happens sooner rather than later, with some open banking standards will come from the private sector, like I mentioned, either through efforts with the, some of our payments providers. We're, we're just about at the top of the hour. I do wanna ask one more question because I think it was something that came up in Patrick's presentation that did catch my ear too. You mentioned um, whether credit unions want to be a, a, a platform based or if they wanna, I think you said a traditional financial institution or, or offer their services on a platform. Uh, we have someone who asked, what did you mean by CU's preferring to be a platform based to control the consumer relationship, Patrick? So in a lot of other regions where we've seen open banking uh, become more advanced, we often see these, um, uh, these types of institutions who, we say that they offer a platform because they allow other financial institutions to host their products and their services on this platform. So typically, for, for example, for a credit union, you may not you, you may not actually hold the primary customer relationship. You may just host or put your products on a, um, someone else's platform. And my, my example was um, kind of like Amazon for banking in where you could be selling or offering credit union products through a platform like Amazon, but specifically for financial services. And, and a lot of credit unions have been discussing here about whether or not they want to strive to be that the type of institution who creates the platform where financial institutions offer their products, or if they want to focus on just re really um, designing their own products that they list on other people's platforms. So there's been a lot of debate and discussion about which, um, which path they would like to go down. And just a final question, um, because it's such a good one, and then I promise I'll let everyone go here. Um, Miranda asks, if we have any universal APIs at an international level, so if we as a country want to take open banking to the next level, we will have to start postulating this idea early on, not to mention all of the regulatory hoops that would need to be jumped through. Anybody want to take that one? <laughs> I would say right. the, most, the most popular one is most likely FTX. I, would, I wouldn't call it the most, uh, I wouldn't call it a universal standard, but it does definitely cross borders. I know it's quite popular down in the US and they've, um, they have a growing presence here in Canada as well, where, where they've recently started a, a Canadian chapter that has support from a lot of the industry. Okay, um, and if anyone's interested, um, I will be posting this uh, entire webinar to our YouTube channel later, and I'm going to include links, um, a link to Patrick's presentation, or excuse me, the re comprehensive report that Patrick mentioned in his uh, presentation. I'm going to include a link to that as well, because I know a couple of people on here have asked for that. So, but that's going to do it for this webinar. Again, if you wanna see it uh, or share it with anyone, if you got a lot out of it and you wanna share it with colleagues, you can go to our YouTube channel. Again, that's youtube.com slash woku, youtube.com slash woku. Lance, Michael, Patrick, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon.